I want to welcome the worldwide audience of Manifest. I have a special word for you. I was taping here in Israel uh, up on a very high mountain of a fortress, and I knew there was one more message that I was supposed to present to the worldwide audience of our telecast. And the Spirit of God spoke to me on the power of persistence in pursuing a promise. Now listen to me carefully again. The power of persistence in pursuing a promise, all right? Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a story from the Bible that's quite remarkable. I am standing in an area that directly in front of me would be what Abraham saw the first time that he viewed the promised land. We are in the Golan Heights, we're in the upper part of Israel, the northern part. Directly in, right over here to my left is Syria. Directly behind me is Lebanon. Jesus, when he came, made this statement, I am not come but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What that meant was this, the Old Testament prophets were predominantly Hebrew prophets. And these Hebrew prophets gave promises of a Messiah that would come. And when this Messiah would come, he would bring about healing. One of the prophets of the Old Testament said that the son of righteousness would arise with healing in his wings. Isaiah 53 said that with his stripes, we would be healed. We also know that according to the Bible, that there was a name of God that was given, which was Jehovah Rapha. And that word Rapha means God that heals. That word Rapha actually comes from a, a word that if you look at the etymology of the word, means to stitch a fabric together, to take fabric and to weave fabric. What the Lord does when he heals somebody is he stitches up that situation. Just like a doctor goes into a wound, the wound is bleeding and he cleans the wound and he stitches it up and eventually the body can heal itself if it's a strong, healthy immune system. So Jehovah Rapha is the God that stitches you up. He stitches you up with physical infirmity by healing you, with emotional difficulties by taking away the grief and sorrow and the pain in your life. And there's so many ways that God can manifest his healing. Now let's go into again what the prophets knew. Messiah was coming, but he was going to come to the Hebrew people first to present a new covenant. Jeremiah said that the Lord would put his covenant in your heart and not just on paper. Now this would be fulfilled through the Messiah. So Jesus comes to this part of Israel and he, he hangs around the Galilee, he hangs around the Jewish synagogues, he ministers in the synagogues, but then the crowds become so large that they can't house him in the facilities. So now he goes to the outdoors and he begins to preach outdoors. He, the Beatitudes are outside the uh, healing miracles, the blessing of the children did not happen in the synagogue, but it happened outdoors because the crowds became so large. Jesus decides to do something that seems very outside the box. Now, let me explain. In the time of Jesus, there was a great animosity between the Jewish people and the Gentile people. The religious Jewish people, which would consist of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, had a lot of teachings that had been handed down to them from their rabbis that were very anti-Gentile in nature. In fact, the Gentiles who were non-Jews were considered to be heathens and pagans by many of the devout Pharisees or Sadducees. So Christ comes and suddenly he is being received not by his own people of his own ethnic nationality, but he's being re received by the Gentile people, which would be the people in the upper and the lower Galilee. These would be people from Lebanon, people from Syria, people from Jordan, etc., that were non-Jews. So they're, they're following him, the crowds are getting larger, but what he does, he comes into Lebanon and there is a, uh, a woman that he comes across who is called a Syrophoenician. She's a Phoenician woman with a the Phoenician background, but the Bible said she is a Canaanite, meaning that her descendants were some of the early Canaanites that you read about in the Old Testament. She has a daughter that is being controlled by an evil spirit. So she goes to Jesus hearing 
who he was, hearing about him. And she says to him, Lord, would you heal my daughter? For she is grievously vexed of a devil. Now that word grievously vexed, that word grievous in Greek is to be uh, to the point of, of uh, great pain and great anxiety and great hurt and great harm. Grievous, very grievous. It was causing the mother stress, but it was causing the daughter extreme torment with whatever affliction she had. Now, Jesus rejects this woman completely and he makes this statement. He says, I cannot give the children's bread to the dogs. Now, if we you talk about being politically correct, if a preacher in America would say that today, the news media would go totally ballistic. They would uh, get rid of his ministry. They would demand him to be fired for he has called a woman of another ethnic group a dog. But in the culture of that day, Gentiles, uh, this is the, the the dogs were considered to be Gentiles, and it was not like some. Um, uh, it's kind of hard to describe it in our culture today, but in other words, he was not trying to totally insult the woman. He's basically saying the children's bread is healing. The children are the people of my ethnic heritage that comes from the natural seed of Abraham. So I cannot give the healing covenant to those who were outside of the house of Israel. Now watch what happens. This is a great story. So the woman then begins to worship him and she makes a statement that totally transforms history as it relates to healing. She says, but Lord, even the dogs want the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Now this woman understood something about the bread, that if you take a loaf of bread and you Look at the ingredients. There's flour in the bread. There can be sugar in the bread. There can be salt in the bread. There can be leaven in the bread. And there's also water in the bread to make the dough. So she understood that if I get a crumb, I actually get everything that's in the entire loaf. And they had in that day what was called lap dogs. And the lap dog would be the family pet among the Gentiles. And that dog would be the dog that would be allowed in the house. It's just like pets we have today. And it would be a dog that would sit in the lap of the master, of the owner of the house. And he could actually, he wouldn't eat from the table, but he could feed him. You, you, you know how people do, they give their dog a bone, they give their dog a treat. And this was called a lap dog. So she was basically saying, look, I don't care if I am a dog. I don't care if I am a Gentile. All I need is a little touch. All I need is one touch from you. And, the, and Jesus just, I can see him smiling, breaking out a smile. He said, man, what great faith you, you have. Your daughter is healed this very hour. And please note the point because this is the point of my message. Persistence in pursuing a promise persistence in pursuing a promise. Imagine that Abraham is 75 years of age and waits 24 and a half, almost 25 years actually, before the promise is fulfilled that his son Isaac is born. Think about the fact that God tells the people the Messiah is coming in Genesis 3.15 and will defeat and crush the head of the serpent and 4,000 years goes by before that Messiah, Jesus Christ, comes to the planet and fulfills the prophecies that are laid down both in the Torah, the Psalms, and the prophets. There is a persistence that must be in your life when you are seeking God for an answer to prayer. My wife and I, and I'm going to teach you something, and I'm not going to get too personal with this, and I've told this before, but we had a situation in our, among our children, our family, and one of my children was struggling so great at an early age, in their later teens and into their early 20s, to the point that the enemy on one occasion could have taken their life. And we literally had to pray in a hospital emergency room that God would spare the life of someone in my family, my own son actually, that I love with all of my heart. And I remember something. I remember that the battle was a nine year battle. And there were times, and parents, I'm talking to some of you that may have a child that's addicted or, or you have someone that's on drugs or alcohol, but they have an addiction. It's very serious and you're concerned about them. You're concerned. What happens if they have an overdose? What happens if they drive in an automobile uh, and they're drunk and they hit somebody? What happens if they get in trouble and they go to prison? See, this is something that young people in their teens and early 20s don't understand, but when they become a parent, they will. 
but in their early teens, it doesn't click with them. And I remember the Lord taught me something and I want to teach you. I've taught this across the United States. I've shared it in revivals, but I don't know how many times I've actually shared it on manifest. And I believe it's the will of God today for me to give someone a word that's an absolute word from the Lord that they need to hear. I remember that when he was struggling with this addiction problem, that we were in a big meeting in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and we were praying, and my wife and I were praying for God to touch him. And we would, it, it, it's like this, we would see progress, and then we would see a setback, progress and a setback, progress and a setback. And it seemed to be a cycle of progress and a setback. It was like a repetitive cycle. And Robbie James, who was with me then, he is behind one of our cameras here. And I remember that the moment we received a phone call right after I stepped out from the pulpit, received a phone call that something had happened. And immediately it's like my faith began to fail and I, I became disheartened and I began to say things with my mouth that were negative toward my son. And I began to say things almost to the point of, well, I might as well give up. What about all this prayer? It doesn't seem to be doing it. I was getting real negative. Now, two, two things happened to me at that moment that changed my life and that later helped us to get our breakthrough. And we're talking about persistence when you're waiting for a promise. Now remember, we're in a nine year battle. It stretched out for nine years. We'd see breakthrough, setback, breakthrough, setback, breakthrough, setback for those nine years. But here's what changed it for me. Now I feel the anointing and someone is gonna receive this and this is gonna help you with your family. I remember that the Lord spoke to me when I was being negative with the words of my mouth and he said to me, don't abort your breakthrough. Now I knew what he was telling me. This is what he was saying. He was saying, you have prayed all these prayers and you've asked me to save him. You've asked me to deliver him. You've asked me to bring freedom to his life and break this addiction and bondage that he's under. But when you begin to say you believe and then you turn around in a bad situation or a negative situation where it doesn't seem like it's happening and you talk against it, then the adversary, and I base this on Job chapter one and two, also Revelation 12, the adversary can come before the throne and begin to say, you do not, you cannot answer his prayer because he has said one thing one day and he's countering what he is saying another day. In other words, one moment you believe and three or four days later you you speak against what you've been asking for. Now, let me stop and say it this way. In my earlier ministry, I remember praying with people and they would say the anointing would be strong and the presence of God would be there and we would lay hands on them and pray for God to touch them in some manner. And uh, you could feel the, the power of God be released and they'd say, oh man, I feel that God's still doing something. I can sense it. And you said, all right, this is it. Let's believe it's gonna happen. Yes, yes. And five minutes later, they would turn and say, please keep praying for me that God will do it. And it's like, oh my goodness, it's like letting the air out of a balloon. It's like, Ooh. I think, oh my goodness, what did they just experience? What was that they just felt? And now they're talking like they don't believe what they just experienced. It's, it, the Bible says it this way, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then we find the Bible says, hold fast the profession of our faith, nothing wavering. Cast not away therefore your confidence that has great re recompense of reward, for you have need of patience, knowing after you've done the will of God, you shall receive the promise. So you have all these scriptures that says we have to hold fast, maintain our confession. What I was doing was I was believing when I was praying, but when something would happen that was not looking like it was being answered, I would speak like I was agreeing with it's not being answered. So God said, every time that you counter what you're saying, you pray, you say you believe, but you counter it with your confession, you abort your breakthrough. The enemy can come and tell me, you can't answer that prayer, you can't touch his son because he's talking against it. Man, I got so convicted, I just began to, I broke down, I remember I began to weep and cry and I broke down, I said, oh God, forgive me because I realized what I'm doing for nine years, I would believe one minute and I would doubt the next and I would say I believe and I'm holding on to God and then my mouth would say something else. Now remember, God and the enemy both hear what you confess with your mouth. They, they both hear what you say. And so the Lord spoke to me and he said, if you have to change your confession. And the second thing the Lord gave me that is one of the most powerful revelations, and I'm giving this to you today because I want you to understand how to be persistent when pursuing a promise 
from the Bible or a promise that God has dropped in your spirit. You have to be persistent, consistent, unwavering, in faith, nothing wavering. This is what the Bible says. So the second thing the Lord gave me was this. He said, you are always saying, if God ever touches my son, if God ever delivers him, and and I, and I believe God was going to do it, but it was always if, if, if this happens, if this happens, if, and it hit me that if, it's not a positive right now faith. If, if is like, are you going to go to church? Well, if it doesn't rain. Are you going to give that to that person? Well, if I feel if. When you put an if, if always con connotates a doubt. When Satan came to Jesus, he said, if you be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. If you be the son of God, jump off the pinnacle of the temple. So the if was a question. And I realize, and this is the Spirit of God giving me this revelation. He's given me a revelation that says every time that you say, if God ever touches him, if God ever does this, you're doubting. That is not a statement of faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Oh, did I ever, get, man, I got so convicted by the Holy Spirit. And so the Lord said this to me, quit saying if and say when. And from that moment on, and there's a man behind the camera who's the pastor at OCI, and he can verify what I'm saying to you, that I said to Pastor Robbie, Robbie, God has convicted me about saying if. Do not let me ever say if about my son being touched again. And you know, when, you, when you're used to something and you've done something by habit so often, it's kind of hard to get out of that routine. But I would say, you know, if, and I'd stop and say, no, when God saves him, when God touches him, when God delivers him. And I want to tell you what happened. I'm being as serious as I can be. After a nine year battle, when I, when I, and I'm not saying I was the key to this, but I'm telling you that I, you can either extend the situation or reduce the timing of it by your actions and your words. And this is something the Lord's taught me, and it's in the Word of God. And so when I began to say, boy, I tell you, he's going to be something when he gets touched. He's going to be a great man of God. When he gets delivered, you watch what's going to happen. And the strangest thing began to happen. I began to see a change in my son when I began to quit saying if and I started saying when, and when I quit talking against the breakthrough, when I would pray for him to be touched, I, wouldn't, I refused, no matter how bad it got, no matter how bad the circumstances got, I refused to alter what I was saying, what I believed. So here's what happened. He got up one morning and he said, Dad, he said, I haven't made good decisions in my life. Do you have a job for me in the ministry? And he had told me for years, I never want to work for you. I never want to be in the ministry. I'm interested in preaching, so don't ever try. And, and he, he would add some other other words I can't repeat in the middle of that. But I remember one time the Lord spoke to me and he said that you have to love him unconditionally. And I said to him one day, son, you can talk about me all you want. You can be negative toward me, but nothing you say or do will ever make me love you any less. And nothing you do, you can't do anything. And I meant it to make me love you less than I love you. And I began to see my son in his negative situation at that time, the way that God would look at us. And I began to feel the love that God feels for us when we're in disobedience, when we're not walking with him, when we're doing things we shouldn't do. And yet he looks at us and he says, you know, you're acting crazy. You're not doing my will, but I love you enough to protect you and help you to get through this. And when I began to love my, love him unconditionally, change my if to when, and when I began to quit talking against my breakthrough, I'm telling you, God slowly began to bring a breakthrough. And today I'm a proud grandparent of a little girl, Johanna Gal. Allie Stone, my son's daughter, a wonderful daughter-in-law. My son is doing great working in the ministry. He's, I'm just telling you, I couldn't be happier. And I look at him every day and I say, son, you do not know how proud I am. And that same son that years ago, and I knew it was because of his problems and the addictions. He, it wasn't him talking. Remember one time he was just telling me off and I looked at him and I told him some, and I said, I'm not talking to the fool in you. I'm talking to the king in you because there's a king in you that's about to come out of you and you don't even